We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Modrix. Joining me today is Tony Anscombe, ESAT Chief Security Evangelist. Tony, how are you today? I'm good, thank you, Tom, and it's great to be here. It's great to have you, and it'll be, I guess, a bit of a departure from our normal our normal discussions here, but I think this is an interesting and important topic to at least consider and shed some light on. So why don't we start by getting a little bit of your background and understanding why security and especially cybersecurity is so important to the mining sector? Well, firstly, Tom, let me explain uh, yeah, some of that background. I'm years and years ago, I was a programmer, got into cyber security, well, then security, information security, uh, which has now, of course, become cyber security, and uh, have been in there for maybe 25, 30 years. So it's been, it's been quite a while. But it's so important because even back when I started out programming, I worked for banks. And even back then, the same considerations actually around security were pretty much there in the same way about encryption, personal information, and such like. So while the technologies change, the core concept around security doesn't change. And you say, why is it important around um, the mining business? Well, yeah, just look at how many cyber attacks we see you know, daily. If you pick up computer media, media or even mainstream media these days, it's, it's hard to get away from it, isn't it? It's, uh, it's just everywhere. So how do we try to understand what the risks are within the mining space? And as you and I were talking a little bit about before we hit record here this morning, really, these are critical pieces of infrastructure that are at risk, even from these electronic, you know, vulnerabilities that they have? Well, I think the mining sector is particularly interesting. One, because a lot of mines are in very remote places and in some very weird places in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, So already you've got a remoteness to the actual where the mining operation is. Um, you know, and I say that because the mining operation might be in one place, but the mining company might be in another. But you know, potentially a cyber criminal that gets into a mining company's system, you know, could take down and disrupt the mining operation. And there might be limited connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. And if we look at some of those mining operations, they've probably been in process for you know, 10, 20 years. And a lot of the technology or the equipment used probably is 10, 20 years old. Uh, A lot of it was probably designed not to be connected and ends up being connected. And that's because, you know, companies now want to monitor the equipment. They want to see, you know, visibility of what's running and what's what's being productive, et cetera. Um, Whereas a lot of that operational technology the actual machines that are doing the mining and, you know, haulage of whatever it is they're mining away and things like that probably probably wasn't really designed for it. And what that means is it will have vulnerabilities, it will have considerations that potentially make it an attack, a good attack surface for a cyber criminal to actually come after because it wasn't designed with security in mind. So is this like... You know, give us an example of some of this equipment that might be vulnerable. Is it basically older equipment being retrofit to be connected so that, you know, mining companies can track, as you said, productivity and or let's say location, things like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you you take big industri- industrial type uh, technology that, you know, is very expensive. One is very expensive to purchase to start with and very expensive to replace is probably already still there. And I'll give you I'll give you an example, not from the mining industry, uh, but I, I think you'll understand where, where the example leads us. Uh, back in 2016, ESET, so the company I work for, the cybersecurity company, you know, we uh, found a threat 
in uh, a power power system in Ukraine uh, called Indestroyer. Now, what was interesting about this particular instant was Indestroyer was in an ICS unit, so an industrial control system. So this malware was actually in the ICS, where typically you think of malware, it's on a PC, it's on a Mac, or it's on a server or whatever. It, it infects operating systems. But this was where actually the threat actor had deep knowledge of the operational technology in use in the power grid. And they'd actually infected or, or changed the firmware in the ICS to take control of it remotely. So imagine something like that in a mine. I mean, you could create uh, potential fatalities if you actually suddenly took control of the operational technology. So you not just disrupt it, not a ransomware attack you know, that brings it to a halt, but actually take control of it and start doing something different with it to what the, the operator was expecting. And that's one, it's difficult to detect, but two, it's also, it, it requires very specific knowledge as well. Um, so it's likely to be uh, an activist, a nation state attacker or something like that actually trying to disrupt disrupt the industry. Um, but that's a very good example of it. I mean, you know, to bring you a little bit up to date on that particular issue, uh, we saw in Destroyer 2 when Russia uh, attacked Ukraine, um, this, mal this cyber attack type reappeared. Uh, and a variant of it actually tried to attack the power grid again. But fortunately, we stopped it before it happened. So, you know, as we're talking about these things, you know, it's not just a risk to companies' data, but it's also a potential risk to both of these places. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the company may not actually understand the risk. So I'll use another example. If I go back in time, go back in time even further, you had Stuxnet. You, you know, I'm sure you've heard of Stuxnet. That was a, it was an attack against the Iranian nuclear facility. Okay. Um, and I, I, I use this as an example because it was interesting the way the cyber attacker did it. What they did was they fed the data back to the administrator saying everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. But in reality, they were making the machine do something else. And the centrifuges were actually spinning too fast and breaking. So imagine that scenario in a mining environment where you know, somebody's sitting in an operations room and you've got, you know, I don't know the right terms, unfortunately, Tom, but you know, you've got the big digger down the hole digging whatever it is, yeah, yeah? Um, the drill or, or whatever it might be that's, that's extracting whatever it is you're mining. You may think it's actually operating correctly because if a, a sophisticated cyber attacker has got in there, but in reality, they might be making it do something else mm -hmm. where potentially, yeah, that, that could cause issue with uh, members of staff and operators of the equipment as well if they've lost control of it and don't realize they've lost control of it. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that this is also, you know, the people that are doing this are wanting to basically take control and, you know, blackmail or have a ransom against the company whose piece of equipment this is, whether it's taking control of the equipment and or taking the data from the company as well. Well, I think mining is one of those industries that potentially you have a number of different people that would try and attack it. Um, I mean, the, 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 the scenario you just painted primarily is a cyber attacker that wants to monetize. So he is doing it for financial gain. I, they can get into the mining company, they can inflict ransomware on the mining company's headquarters, or they could try and disrupt the mining process and require you know, a payment. However, um, I personally see mining as part of critical infrastructure because it depends what you're mining, doesn't it, on, on how, what it's being used for etc. So potentially it could be a nation state trying to disrupt another nation's ability to do whatever it is they're doing. So uh, yeah, I'm going to use a really bad example. If you're mining coal, it could disrupt power. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you if you're still using coal to power, you know, power stations uh, or fuel power stations. So it could disrupt society more generally, but also you've got hack uh, the activists as well in there. 
you know, potentially there are activists out there that probably some of them may disagree with how you're mining, what you're mining, where you're mining, et cetera. And they might come after a mining company too and try and disrupt. So you've got that, what we would term hacktivists um, because they're, ha they're hacking in and they're activists and trying to disrupt it. So I think the mining industry is an interesting one because you've probably got all of the all of those types of people actually on the other side that are potential attackers, not just the ones that are monetizing. You know, typically we tend to only hear about the ones monetizing because those are the ones that are most frequent uh, and you know are very disruptive to everyday life. So can this threat also come from like third party equipment on site that these contractors can connect to remotely? Potentially, third party equipment is one of the biggest risks. You know, if if you, you as a company, you have uh, an inventory and you understand and you've audited what equipment you're using and you feel fairly secure about it, then a contractor walks in and plugs in something into your network or plugs in something into your environment. Or you know, maybe a contractor is responsible for servicing part of the machinery on site. Yeah, and they they think, oh well, you know, it will be easy for me to plug something in and leave it plugged in because then I can remote, remotely diagnose things. And uh, hey, you've just opened a great big window, unfortunately, for uh, a hacker to get in as well. I mean, there was a there was an example of that about a year and a half ago in I think it was in Oldsmill in Florida, where I think a contractor had left a remote access system in the water utility in a water utility company. And yeah, it just got left there. And somebody ended up finding it and unfortunately uh, abusing it. Um, fortunately, the operator in that instance actually saw what was happening and, and managed to cut it off. So there was no damage done. But my point is, is yeah, these third party, these third party contractors bring their own equipment in, they put their own mechanisms in place. And often that doesn't meet the policy of the company that um, they're doing it for. So you have to, you know, cybersecurity is about the weakest link. And if somebody brings the weakest link in, then it's likely to get exploited, which is why it's super important that any company, you know, whether you're a mining company or whatever company, actually understands the risk that connecting to third parties or when third parties come onto site, you know, actually understanding the risk that they're bringing into the company. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's exactly where I was kind of thinking about with this situation is that this isn't something that is normally considered. And when this threat is, or whether they know it or not, this threat is present. And especially, you know, when third parties are coming in, maybe that's a consideration that some of these companies need to be aware of, rather than, you know, just completely unaware that this is a risk that is present. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we there are so many examples where third uh, and the other where third parties have been the mechanism to get to the other company as well. So, you know, you remember back in the in, in the US, you saw Target get breached a number of years ago, and that was a, one of the big first big data breaches that happened. You know, how did they get in through a HVAC contractor? Yeah, who would think it? Yeah, but actually, a cyber criminal would because unfortunately, it's the weakest. The weakest connection in. So, you know, when a company now signs a contract, yeah, they should actually make sure that they're giving that company the pot their their cybersecurity policy and saying, this is what you need to adhere to. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to understand that you're signing up to the same policy and regime that we have that keeps our, our equipment, our staff, our, our business secure. Mm -hmm. um, and the other element around there as well that I've seen recently is in some contracts, companies are now insisting that actually the third party has cyber risk insurance. And, and the reason they're asking for that is that if they then end up needing to make a third party claim, i.e. if the hacker comes in through that third party, it's on their insurance that, that actually the claim is going to be on because they need to be covered for that third party. You're, you're their third party, remember, as much as they're your third party. So, Tony, what role is AI starting to play within the mining industry? And can this be a risk as well? Well, I'm not sure what role it plays in the AI industry specifically, but I can tell you where, it's, where it sits from a, a cybersecurity perspective. Um, you know, back in, I would say, early 2000s, what you saw was an explosion of cy uh, cyber 
related mal, you know, cyber malware, uh, cyber cyber attacks, and actually. Uh, for example, ESET, the company I work for, the cybersecurity company, we deployed machine learning back in uh, those early 2000s into our products. Now, in, in early 2000, if we'd said to our customers, oh, we're using an, an AI-type technology to protect you, I think we'd have, we'd have lost the yeah, – the customer would have looked confused, like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Um so it's not it's not actually a new thing that's being used, but it's but it is becoming now more advanced uh, in the way we use it. So if suddenly we can actually, for example, if you're using th threat intelligence, you might be able to ask a threat intelligence system, you know, I want to understand all these types of threats against this type of equipment uh, that have happened in this geography, and suddenly you're going to start to get real intelligence back, which will help that company understand then what the threats are. So AI is being used both in product to detect threats because there's a massive, as we know, what AI is good at is, is quickly uh, understanding data and coming up with conclusions around data. So you know, as you can imagine in cybersecurity, there's an awful lot of data going around. Mm -hmm. um, so it's being used for that, but it's also being used to help contextualize things as well. So AI is, is, is a big part of cybersecurity. But for companies, you know, I, I think AI is going to present an interesting issue. Um, and I'm not, I'm not talking specifically here about mining, uh, but imagine you have an AI model that is an algorithm that is telling you where underground or is, is predicting probability underground of where a certain resource is. Where, so where you should be pointing your mining infrastructure. Um, what if a cyber criminal gets in there and actually doesn't exfiltrate data, doesn't encrypt anything, doesn't cause mass disruption, but poisons the data and actually inserts data that makes the AI algorithm give out bad output? So there's, I think there's this huge risk that actually potentially we're going to see a different type of cyber attack of AI poisoning. Uh, because and that will be a lot harder to rebuild from because you won't know what data that they've inserted or how they've adjusted the algorithm. I think that will be a particularly difficult type of cyber attack. So, Tony, what are some practical solutions when we're thinking about these problems that can be implemented by companies that want to be proactive in this area? Well, so firstly, you need to follow a cybersecurity framework. Um, and the framework, yeah, it's more than a tick list, but th think of it, it, it's a big long list of policies and, and things that you need to go off and do and, and the considerations you need to have. Now, they'll be, they will be slightly different for every organization. They will mean different things. But so, for example, if you look at things recently, um, both actually cybersecurity frameworks and insurers will require you to have EDR, which is Endpoint Detection and Response Solutions. And what that what those are doing is we're all familiar with somebody finding malware, i.e., an antivirus product. But what an EDR product actually does is sits on the endpoint and looks for anomalies in traffic. So say suddenly you've had your credentials stolen. Yeah, you know, somebody socially engineered you, they've stolen your credentials, they've managed to get on your machine, they've not done anything, uh, they've not deployed anything malicious like ransomware or, or a Trojan or anything like that but they're just sitting on your machine and watching what's happening and feeding back to a command and control infrastructure where they're then looking for what data is important. Mm -hmm. So EDR will actually look at that data and turn and say, well, there's something weird going on on your machine. You've got this external communication going on. Yeah, there's this process that we don't know what's running on there. And it will flag that to an administrator. So those advanced type of technologies that are no longer looking for what I define as the traditional, you know, an attachment in an email or a piece of malware, they're looking for the, the anomaly. And that anomaly will flag to, to the administrator that something's wrong for them to go and investigate. Now, the importance here is that the administrator actually needs to go and investigate it. Some companies deploy this technology so that they can tick the box and say, yeah, we've got all this. Yeah, we've done this go to their board and say, yeah, we've got all this cyber security in place, and then they ignore the alerts. Yeah, because they're resource strapped or whatever. So it's important that actually it's a continual process. Absolutely. I can imagine, you know, a scenario where 
you know, you, you implement these things because it's a, it sounds like a good idea, but the, the follow through maybe isn't there because you don't know what to do with that information at the end of the day. Well, we know, don't we? we you know, look at the numbers that are published on a frequent basis around the shortage of cybersecurity professionals. Yeah, you know, I think currently the world is short of about 3 million cybersecurity professionals. So there is a resource issue. And when you mentioned AI earlier on, of course, that's one of the other things that AI has brought to the cybersecurity industry. As there's such a shortage of resource, what you do is you start automating tasks and allowing the machine, allowing decisions to be made intelligently by software and by machines um, so that in effect if you've got the list of 200 things that, are, that appear on your screen of things to do you know maybe 150 of them can be taken care of automatically through process yeah and you only end up then needing to look at the top 50 or whatever that number might be right so tony give us a, a sense of the scale of you know hard cost that this ends up taking out of some of the, the systems in the world that are being affected by these attacks. What do you mean by that, Tom? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Well, I know in, I think it was 2015, this was costing something like $3 trillion. Oh, okay. These, these, yeah, these yeah. cyber attacks were costing like something like $3 trillion. Okay, so if we look at um, the cost to business, and bear in mind this is a, 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 a lot, you know, bigger cost. So back in 2018, um, so a, a, doc, a guy called Dr. Michael McGuire estimated the cost of cybercrime on business was, was um, I think it was about $10 trillion, no, uh, $1.8 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at how that then progressed, uh, the World Economic Forum two years later said it was $6 trillion, Current estimates put it at around $14 trillion by the end of 2027. So it's costing businesses an awful lot of money. But in that number, it's not just about the cost of cybersecurity, the cost of dealing with an incident, et cetera. It's also the cost of, cost of loss of business, business disruption, loss of IP, all those types of things as well. So it's a, it's a massive cost. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it? A mine, somebody that runs a mining company might sit there and turn and say, well, why would I be a target? You know, why do I need to spend all this money on cybersecurity? Well, the question should, shouldn't really be there. It's like, why do you put a fence around the mine? Yeah? I mean, you put a fence around the mine to stop people coming in. And then why do you have a security guard on the gate as well to let make sure the right employees are coming in and leaving? I mean, it, you, you don't... You don't pass on those security. Just because it's not physical security doesn't mean it's not, not needed and that you're not a target. Unfortunately, everybody is a, a, a target of cyber attackers, especially as certain industries may start to become a little bit more cyber, cyber aware and cyber secure. You know, cyber criminals will start going to look for other targets, easier targets. Um, so it's not uh, it, this it should not be a choice. I think that's my point is this shouldn't be a choice. Yeah. Cybersecurity is part of doing business and it's important actually that you have the right plan in place and that you show resilience. And one of the things the US have done recently is if you're a public company listed on the NYSE, yeah, one of the one of the things now they they they're asking the question of do you have cybersecurity people on the board, a, a director that's aware of, you know, actually what cybersecurity is. And, of course, they've made disclosure mandatory. So you have to disclose to the exchange that you've had a cybersecurity incident. So my, my point here is that, actually, in that instance, it's going to affect your stock price. Any cybersecurity material cybersecurity incident, you're going to have to report and becomes public information. So companies need to take this really seriously. Well, it's interesting that you mention this necessity to report, really. You know, I was I was doing some research this morning in preparation for this chat that we're going to have about this past Monday's attack or glitch, let's call it, by the New York Stock Exchange. And there was actually another issue that the New York Stock Exchange had in the past couple of years, where they were actually fined $10 million for not reporting it in time. So I think that's a perfect example of exactly what you're talking about. 
Yeah, so different different places have different regulations. So um, because we're talking primarily about the NYC there, if you look at the US, I mean, critical infrastructure needs to report incidents to CISA. Uh, insur- insurance and finance companies might need to report to the FDIC. You know, if you're a public company, you might need to report to the New York Stock Exchange. So different different industries, one might end up having to report to multiple places. But the vast majority of companies don't need to report any cyber incidents. So the actual scale of the problem is probably not really known. Um, And I say that because if you look at the FTC's data, the FTC uh, produced a report every year on incidents reported to through the FBI, the IC3, the FBI's IC3 and the FTC combined reporting I think shows last year there was about 22,000 business email compromise incidents and only about 2,500 ransomware incidents. Yet if I look at net diligence in the US, who's a cyber risk insurer, if I look at their data, it shows way more incidents (laughs) than the reported crimes. So therefore, it means people aren't aren't reporting them to law enforcement. So I think it's important that there is some element of reporting because we need to understand the size of the problem Mm -hmm. so that the right resort governments can put the right resources in place to actually go tackle cybercrime. But what you also don't want to do is get in the way of response. Yet if, for example, a mining company had a cyber incident, you don't want the first thing that you start thinking about is get the lawyer. We need to report to the mining regulator that we've got a cyber incident. Mm. You actually want to be dealing with the incident. Yeah, the disclosure should somehow be detached from the actual incident in, in, in the real time. You'd be struggling enough to deal with the incident. Yeah, and of course, this is really we're just talking about the other side of the risk to mining companies. You know, Barrick Gold was one of the ones that had this glitch on Monday on the New York Stock Exchange, as well as Berkshire Hathaway. You know, these shares dropped over 90 plus percent instantly. So when we look at the explanation that was kind of given post hoc now as a technical glitch, as a security expert, when you hear that explanation, you know, is that satisfactory to you? Well, it depends what, what's meant by a technical glitch. I mean, typically, if um, if it's a cyber attack of the type that I think we'd, we'd all understand, i.e. somebody's trying to disrupt something, you would see the glitch would be broad. Uh, you know, it would take down all stocks or it would affect all stocks. I think in this, the instant you're referring to was limited, wasn't it? It was only certain... Uh, symbols like a, that were actually a total of 40 symbols yeah effect. and that li- that limit would imply it's something different that would imply it's it's maybe uh, a software glitch um or somebody ch- something changed in the, in the software or maybe there's an automated trading algorithm that in some way was doing something weird but again i it, it doesn't i'm not saying it's not a cyber attack because we don't know yeah but I, my hunch would be it's not. My hunch would be that's more of an internal glitch or error that's been made internally. And uh, maybe we'll see what comes out of it. Um, because I think if, there, if you know, were there any, did anybody short the stocks? You know, did, was there any massive trades that somebody, yeah, because a cyber attacker in that instance is probably going to want to monetize. Right. And they're going to monetize somehow. Um, and in fact, I'll, I'll give you a great I'll give you a great example of that. I, I met with a, a cyber insurer from the Netherlands who was telling me about a claim they had from a, mar- a maritime company who had a ransomware attack on one of their their vessels. So a boat, and the boat was carrying um, I forget what it was carrying. I think it was carrying. I want to say it was avocados. Yeah, and it was going to a very small nation. And what they did was it increased the price of avocados or something on an exchange. I'm sure it was avocados. And they'd actually bet that they realized afterwards that somebody had bet on the price of the commodity going up. And it did. So I'm just saying cyber attackers are not always, it's not always straightforward. They might be making money some, some other way. 
maybe somebody made money this other, on the MYS, MYSE issue. But I I suspect that's just a, I would hasten to speculate that that's a software glitch. So, Tony, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about, let's say, general AI. How do you view the risk of AI to humanity? And, and do you think that we should have a moratorium of sorts on development so that there can be some better rules established before going even deeper into this space? Well, we certainly need some yeah, good ethics and good rules around it because, unfortunately, you know, companies and society will abuse technology uh, if, there, if there are no boundaries. Mm-hmm. So somebody will work out they can profit from it or use it in a way maybe that's not ethical for society. So we do need to have some rules around it. Um, you know, there, there are there are good examples. That are, in fact, I'll give you one where, which is a very practical example. You know, what happens when we all have autonomous cars? Um, you know, does that mean we no longer need to have car parks because I can just get out of my car and let it drive around for a bit and pick me up later? Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't need to pay the $30 to park it or $40 to park it anymore. Um, but if we all do that, then there'd be more cars on the road. Yeah. So there, there's a great example of why an AI-based technology needs some sort of regulation. Does that mean I can't just get out of my car and let it drive around on its own with nobody in it? So therefore, I need some sort of regulation around it. And there are, you know, there are far better better examples. But we also need to remember that a lot of AI technology is also good. I think when we when we hear certain things like facial recognition, people suddenly go, ah, and have this negative view of it because we think that's a privacy infringement. You know, there was a case a couple of years back where the Indian government used it on a station in India and repatriated 3,000 missing children with their parents. You know, that's it, facial recognition being used in the right way. So my point here is the technology, yeah, you know, the technology has certain things it can provide. Yeah. You know, and we need to make sure that, that it provides them for the good. Yeah. And regulate so that it's not abused in any way or just misused. You know, my example of the car driving around is probably just misuse. Yeah. Um, so there does need to be some boundaries. Yeah, again, it's the tool that can be either used for good or for bad it's not necessarily the tool itself that is good or bad absolutely and the the next question people often ask tom is yeah have we been seeing any ai generated cyber attacks um and the answer to that i think is no um other than or maybe not yet (laughs) well yeah that's you're probably more correct there yes not yet um but what we are seeing is an improvement in some of the some of the attacks. I So for example, the phishing emails that land in your inbox now, you can stop looking for the full stop, you know, the, the full stops and the bad grammar and the, the, and the capitalizations being in the wrong place. Because of course, what they're doing is using AI generated tools to, to language models to give you a perfect email to send out for phishing. So that no longer, longer works. So are, is AI being used by cyber criminals? Yes. Is it being used to automate attacks in the way that maybe I think, you know, Hollywood, you know, some Hollywood movies think about these things. Not yet. Um, And let's hope they don't. But yeah, we know they will at some stage. You can, you can use AI at this point to become a more convincing Nigerian prince. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So Tony, do you think it's, it's possible for this development of AI to be restricted by all nations, including the biggest competitors in this space like China? Or is it possible that this is almost like, in a way, like a Cold War for the 21st century that we could be, you know, if we do have a moratorium on development just to establish some rules, that we give competitors more of a lead? Well, I don't think you can think of it, um, or can you think of it that way, maybe. Yeah, it's an advancement in technology, and it's understanding how that advancement will affect society. So if you go back to the days of, you know, when cars first hit the road, you know, they weren't going to be reliable, you wouldn't be able to go long distances in them, and these machines were going to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
um, when you had the Industrial Revolution, people turned and said this automation for, and it was primarily in the cotton industry and the weaving industry, you know, there's not going to be any jobs for anybody anymore. Yeah, we're all going to be unemployed. Mm-hmm. Well, history, show, history should show us that actually when technology evolves, we adapt. Yeah, and we'll adapt with AI as long as it's being used in the right way. So I don't see... I, I don't see the arm, AI Armageddon that I think some people do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we will just find that it, it fits into certain things in society and not everything. Right. And we need to understand the limitations of where it should fit and where it shouldn't fit. Um, but that's not to say there's, there's – sure, there's going to be certain sectors in the marketplace, you know, customer service type centers, you know, where I can get – Suddenly, the chatbot is actually reasonable and doesn't just, you know, make me sit there for thirty minutes and answer nothing. Mm-hmm. Maybe it becomes intelligent and actually can help me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe you know some of those types of positions will end up being no longer needed. But companies will find other uses for those people. Yeah, or they'll they'll venture off into other parts of parts of industry. You know. It's not, I don't believe the Armageddon is coming that some people predict. Excellent, Tony. Well, I appreciate you shedding light on a, you know, a bit of a different topic for us, but I think, you know, this is something important to consider for mining executives and, you know, maybe even shareholders of companies to make sure that, you know, the company that you're holding shares in is doing their due diligence to protect themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say, you know, reach out to one of my ESET colleagues and, and have a discussion around cybersecurity. While we're we're a vendor, we're also very happy to discuss what the requirements are and what the needs are of businesses to make sure they're secure on a wider scale. You know, historically, you know, we're, we're a 30-year-old company and we are still very much seen as a research company. Uh, if you look at a lot of what we publish, it's it's deep research on technical issues, malware, cyber attacks, et cetera. So, yeah, we, we're a product company, but we're also a group of researchers that have deep knowledge about some of these some of these issues. So please feel free to reach out to us and, and have a discussion with us. Where would people be able to do that if they want? That's a good point, isn't it, Tom? Uh, well, there's two sites, actually. One is we publish our research on a, on a website called welivesecurity.com. Uh, and then there's the company website, which is eset.com. Perfect. And of course, you're available on Twitter as well, at Tony, A-T-E-S-E-T, at Tony, at ESET. Tony, thanks yeah, so much Tony, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure, Tom. Anytime. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.